that, you know, there's a lot of us that are tired today. Uh, yesterday was a long day. For me, it was too. You guys were playing floor hockey. I was refereeing in the morning, and then I left at about so 11 o'clock, went golfing, and that um, litany of pen penance, penance? I'm sure I like pen penance. But anyways, it was very appropriate this morning, Joyce, because uh, I want to talk about frustration. The back nine was horrible. I lost nothing. I lost more balls yesterday than I've lost in the whole summer. And uh, had to pull four more sleeves of, of golf balls out of my closet and put them into my bag um, because I lost way too many. And then we ended up getting to the 17th hole and the horn blew because we had to come in because of the, the lightning. And uh, so the last hole I parked. Uh, didn't play it, but I parted. But uh, so it's been a good, it was a good, I had a good day. Today we're going to have some more uh, fun together. We're going to play some more floor hockey. Calvin shot the ball and hit the referee yesterday. And then in the same game, someone else hit the ball from that team of Super Dave. And uh, if they keep it up, they may not win to, to, today in any games. Uh, I'll just call, I'll call penalty after penalty. No, then that wouldn't be good either. But uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture in Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. It's a passage that we hadn't read, uh, we had the first portion of it read already. And uh, it's a passage I have been directed to, I think, uh, for a number of weeks. Um, one verse in particular, the 17th verse, it talks to pastors and or ministers mainly. But I wanted to share with you this, these passages, this passage this morning, Joel chapter 2. Um, in our world, we need Christians to wake up from their slumber, I think, and get on fire for God. We need Christians to just be excited about what is going on in their life. We need Christians who are vibrant. Uh, Lincoln came and we prayed together this morning, and, and it seemed that God brought to my mind, even in that time, that we just need we need people that would just to be, to be awakened. Um, people that are ready to share their faith. People ready to, to tell what God has done in their lives. But before we can do that, we need to have our lives back on track with God. You know, we get excited about our sports. Just here, yesterday we had a blast. This afternoon is going to be, I'm sure it's going to be more fun too. And we get excited about the arts. We get excited about our cars. We get excited about buying homes. We get excited about lots of things. We get excited about when we get to see our friends we haven't seen for years. You know, this week uh, we had the annual annual meeting for the Southern Baptist Convention in Canada, and I got to see friends from across Canada, and it's exciting. it's great to be able to see them. So we, there's lots of things that get us really excited, lots of things that get us really enthusiastic and happy. Yet, these things can be also a distraction to our walk with God, because sometimes they take a priority over. In our lives with God, they take a priority over over who we who, who God is and over our worship. I have uh, a sister that um, at one time was the most committed, I think, of our whole family. She was at Sunday every at, at church every Sunday. She played the piano every Sunday. She taught Sunday school from when she was probably uh, eleven or twelve. Because you know, in small churches, that often happens. That you, you get to be a preteen and, and uh, you need help, so that you're in the Sunday school class. Teaching, not just helping. You know, in our church we get the teenagers, the preteens and teenagers helping in Sunday school. But in, in this case, my sister taught and everything. Now, she doesn't go to church. She allowed issues in her life to get in the way. Now, I would say today she's probably allowed sports to get in the, in the way. You know, um, it's, it's danger when we allow these things to get in the way of our walk with God. You know, I believe that she made a commitment of faith. I believe that she's a Christian, but I believe that she is way far away from God. In Acts chapter 8, or probably in Acts, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we see how we are to be a witness to that are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, I'm going to come and I'm going to fill you with the Spirit so that you can be my witness in Jerusalem and Samaria and around the world, around the uttermost parts of the world. Yet most of the time we are thinking about being, we think about being a witness in our, and we, we live our lives that seem to be void of the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. We're, just, we're afraid to be a witness. We're afraid to, that we don't think we have a testimony. We don't think that we can do these things. 
things. Yet I believe that we can. We can, we can for sh at, at any time, no matter how long we believe in Christ, no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord, we can be a witness to Him for Him. But again, there's things that get in the way. And I believe that we, in this passage, we can see in this passage in Joel chapter 2, something that, that God is calling the people of Israel to. And it says, even now, the Lord, th this is the, the Lord's de declaration. So this is God talking to his people. This is God declaring to his people that they're, they're uh, uh, an important thing. And so we've been, he, we needed to listen, or they needed to listen. He says, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love. And he relents from sending disaster. Who knows? He may turn and relent and let and leave a blessing behind him, so that you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. And we're going to continue on in a second here. Verse 12 tells us God wants our full attention. He wants us to turn, which means repent. He wants us to change our direction. He wants us to, you know, we're going in this direction and we're going away from Him. We're walking on our own. We're walking after sports. We're walking after the arts. We're walking after whatever it is that we're, that's getting our, our attention. And I pick on sports and the arts just because, you know, that's sort of the big thing these days. But there's lots of things that can distract us. Maybe you're a gamer. Maybe you love video games. And that can be just as much a distraction. In fact, I, 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 I give my son a hard time when he's, when he's playing Xbox because it, I think it changes your personality. Because after he's played for a couple hours, he's grumpy. He's miserable. And that's not his natural, that's not his nature. Alexander, you know, you've met my, my son Alexander, our, our, his, our daughter, or his daughter rather, our granddaughter is here with, our, with us this morning. And uh, he's preaching over at Evangel this morning for their English congregation. And you know, that's, you, if you've met him, you know that's not his personality. The boys of uh, some of the guys have, have gone golfing with him, so he's he's a pretty relaxed guy. He's kind of fun to be around. But when he plays video games, after a few hours, he's just like crappy. I don't know if it's because he's playing World of War and he's killing a bunch of people or whatever, but he's just miserable to be to hang out with. He just has, of course, my wife, if she was. She's in the back, and I, I can't see her, but, but she'd probably say, I'm the same way. Yeah, she's shaking her head. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a real big video game person, but, uh, but you know, I don't know what it is about video games. It's like that, but you know, it, it, anything in this world, anything that we do, anything that, that uh, can grab our attention so much and uh, that it, it draws away from God. God wants our full attention. He wants uh, a change, us to change our minds. He wants us to be... Uh, fully turned on for him to turn from where you're going. More than words, it's actions. With uh, it, it takes action too. You know, in here it tells us what in verse thirteen or verse twelve it says. He says, "Turn, turn with me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning." So, in other words, he says he wants the total. Total attention. He wants and nothing to be distracted. Not even food. Not even anything that uh, gets in our in our way. He wants our full attention, our full heart. In verse thirteen, we get a bit, even a deeper picture of this. It says, "Tear your hearts, not just your clothes." God wants more than just outward appearance too. You know, lots of times we can we can look like we've changed. We can look good. We can we can act the part. We can we can sing the songs. We can um, even read the scripture or quote the scripture. We can do all kinds of things that look like we've made a big change in our lives on the outside. But what's going on on the inside? That's what God's concerned with. You know, I can look like a preacher. Go ahead and bring me up, Seth. I look, look like a great guy. I look like a man of God. But still, there can be things going on on the inside that God needs to deal with. You know, there's been lots of preachers, we can go on TV and things like that, who we've seen fail. Because we've got the appetite of what's on the inside. You know, you might be going, man, I. I been baptized. I prayed that prayer. I've done all these things. I look, I look like I'm, I'm a Christian. But you have to dealt with what's going on. 
issues were, how, how bad they were feeling. Well, God doesn't want you just to look bad like you had a bad thing. You know, you can cry tears, and scripture, scripture tells us tears are not enough. He wants our hearts. He wants us to, us to open our hearts to Him and allow what's inside our hearts to be dealt with. And then in 14, verse 14, God wants to bless you in your effort. Who knows, he may turn to relent, it says he, and leave a blessing behind. I, you know, I, when I think about this, I think of things of, of, of uh, examples like that of Nineveh, where God said, I'm going to destroy that city unless it repents. But he was patient with them. And when they did repent, he changed his mind and, and saved them. God is being patient with us. God wants to bless us. God wants to do things in our lives. God wants to see, see us be successful. He want, you know, I'm not talking about health and wealth gospel. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that you're going to have a brand new car and a brand new home and all these things. But I mean, when I say well, God wants us to be successful, it, it means that He wants us to, to uh, be mentally strong. He wants us to be spiritually strong. He wants us to have all those things. He wants to bless us in our lives in a sense that you know, when, when we, we don't need to be stressful. We don't need to be anxious. What does the scripture tell us? Be anxious for nothing but in prayer. Through prayer, make your request known to Him and He'll, He'll provide for you. God wants to do these things in our lives, but He needs us to be open, to open our hearts and be real. We go on to verse 15 and 16. It says, Blow the horn of Zion and announce a sacred fast. Proclaim an assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children and those, even those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his bedroom and let the bride her honeymoon, honeymoon chamber. Now, Ardell, get up, man. Audrey, real quick, can you come up and, and, and Kelvin, you come up here for me for a second. I'm going to use you as an example. You hit me with the ball yesterday. You, you owe me one. Is that? <laughs> I try. Oh, you come up here for a second for me. <laughs> so you've got the bridegroom. And I, and I see you put the pillows behind Stella, so I'm not going to ask her about it this morning. So, so I'm guessing her back is a sore or something along those lines. So you have an infant. And you have a name. Strong. 
need to be as, as even as individuals, as, as individuals, we need we're called to, to repentance. As a church, we're called to repentance also. As a church, we need to strive to do better. As a church, we need to strive to reach out to the lost. As a church, we need to strive to, to do what the Great Commission has called us to. You know, the Great Commission, I believe, is a commission, is a, is a call to, for all of us, a command to all of us, to reach out to the lost, to, to, to proclaim to those that are, are dying, are lost in this dying world, that, uh, that there's, there's salvation for them. That's a call for each and every, every one of us. It's not a call just for the pastor. It's not a call just for the Sunday school teacher, or the servant leader, or the church council member. It's a, it's a call to each and every one of you, no matter how old or how young you are. No matter how busy you think you are, no matter whether you're the bridegroom or you're the older one, no matter who you are, God is calling you to us to uh, to a work, to be a part of His sharing, uh, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, that gospel that we talk about. You know, you and I cannot sit idle. We can't sit back and watch someone else do the work. You and I need to be a part of the work. You can't say I'm too busy. You know what's interesting about in this passage here, this scripture here, how he calls the bridegroom. Well, the bridegroom for what in, in the Jewish tradition had one year that he had he was excused from whatever he had, he ever, any duty that he, that he had in the community. Why? So that he could get to know his bride better. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Tell him. No jobs for a whole year. Your job, only job, single solitary job, is to get to know Stella better. That'd be, that'd be incredible. But you know what this what we see here in Scripture? He's God is calling even the bridegroom to the task of sharing or being a part of the assembly. Not a single one of us, no matter how many exams you have, no matter how busy your job is, no matter how crazy your family life is, we have no excuse. God is calling us to be a part of His work. And if we are using those excuses, those excuses I, I want to tell you, I believe it's sin. There was a time when I, when I first started school, and when I first started university, and I, I don't know how I, you no, know, I wasn't a really great student, but I used school as, a, as, a, as, a, as my uh, excuse for not doing stuff. But I remember, I've, I've told a few of you, my grade point average at first year, year university is 0.65. No, not 6.5. 0.65 on a four scale. Fantastic, great point eight. But I used all that as an excuse not to go to do stuff. But you know what I found that when I went back to college a few years later, I took I did two years of college, one at North American Baptist, one at Grand McEwen, took a couple years off, we had two children. And when I went back to school, Alexander was two years old and Angelina was six weeks old. We were driving down to Oklahoma and I got down to Oklahoma and I determined at that point that, I, that I'm not going to use school as an excuse or any of those kind of things. God has called me to this. God has called me out and I'm going to try to do my very best to serve Him no matter what I was doing. And so what I would do, you know, a lot of students would, um, when we had finals and uh, or papers, they would, they would cut church and go to uh, and take care of their studying and doing their papers. Now, maybe this is not for everybody, but this is what I felt God could pick me to. I wouldn't miss church. I wouldn't miss And we had Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship. And, and Tawa and, and Vanessa, you guys are down in the States, and they still do this. They still have Sunday morning and Sunday evening. And they also have Wednesday night prayer meeting. And they, man, that's a busy schedule. But Ardell and I can, can, were convicted that we need to be there when part of that church, a part of that assembly, and we didn't have an excuse. We needed to be a part of them to help them to share the good news of Jesus Christ, because that's what our purpose is in our as, as believers in Jesus Christ. So, you know, I, and I want you to know that my, my last three years and a half years of school, down in Oklahoma, I didn't fail an exam. I was disappointed if I got more than 89 on, on, on an exam. My paper's not a great writer, so I was happy with a B. But I never used, used my school as an excuse. I've never used my job as an excuse. I, when, I was, when I worked, uh, and I'm not perfect, I don't want to give you the impression I think I'm perfect, but when I, were, I worked a uh, night shift and I'd get up in the, on Sunday morning and go to church. And I'm proud of my son this morning. He was asked by, uh, by I can't think of, Wayne Hoover, who was the English congregation pastor over at Evangel, to preach on Sunday morning. 
And he said, he didn't even think about it. He said, yes, and I, I'm hoping that's because he saw that example in my, my, my wife and myself. But he worked last night from 7 o'clock and last night to 7 this morning. And he's getting up this morning to preach. You know, I want you to know there's other times that I, I'm, not, I'm not your best example. But I want to know you also to, to see that I want to try. As your pastor, I want to try. As your pastor, I want to try to give you an example. As your pastor, I want to show you that I care. That I won't allow, I won't try to make excuses. I won't try to do those things. And I want you to be the same way with me. As we go on to verse 17, and this is where we get, I get the conviction. It says, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace. An object, an object of scorn among the nations. Why should it be said among the people, where is their God? You want you to know that I, every day I pray for each and every one of you. Not by name necessarily, but as, as I think about you and as I think about your, you going about your work. That's my hope. That you do well. But I pray that as a church, as an assembly here as an English congregation that we never cause anyone around us to say where is their God? Where is their God? Think about your life. As we're going to take time to do, we're going to do a Lord's Supper this morning, communion this morning. I want you to just to take time to really examine your heart. What's getting in the way? What's causing you not to be able to truly serve our Lord and Savior? What's getting in the way of you being the servant that you can be in this church?